Joining me here at the Up Summit is Bob Mumgard. He is CEO and co-founder of Commonwealth Fusion Systems. It's great to speak with you. Thank you for having me. Uh, what brings you to the Up Summit? Uh, it's an interesting collection of people because it, you know, very aspirational about abundance, about technology, and of course, Fusion Energy fits that same ethos. All right, let's take a step back. What is Fusion Energy? Right. So Fusion Energy is the power of the stars. So it's the energy source that produces the abundance of the, the, all the galaxy of stars. And we're working to make that happen here on Earth because it could be the energy source we need to power our next generation of technologies, whether that's AI or mobility or other areas. And I feel like we've talked about fusion energy for a while. What is it about this moment in time where we actually start to realize it? So fusion sits at this intersection of science and technology, but also industrialization. And for a long time, it's been in the realm of science. We figured out how to make the right conditions, what the right type of machines would be for fusion power plants. And about two years ago, though, we saw the first reactions here on Earth in a machine in California that showed that we could actually make more power out than in from the reaction itself. And so that was a, a big you know, starting gun, if you will, about now's the time to think about fusion as a power source, not just as a science uh, curiosity. And we've seen since that moment, investments uh, in fusion go way up, over 50 fusion companies. There's now over $10 billion of private capital invested in fusion. And we're starting to see the first uh, prototype plants be built, including ours in Massachusetts. Yeah, um, and 10 companies, but you're one of the ones that's furthest along, is what I've heard from some of the investors uh, at, a, at an event like this. So we're the largest, we have the, the most people, one of the largest fusion organizations in the world, actually, you know, only smaller than like the Chinese government program. Uh, and we're also the most capitalized, and we're the ones that are building things with uh, actual, you know, steel in the ground, a prototype plant, and plans for a commercial plant. But it is a big industry, and it has, you know, global supply chain, it has issues that relate to government and regulation, and a lot of that actually fits well in this environment uh, where there's some parallels to aerospace. Yeah, and you were at this event last year as well, and it's my understanding that maybe perhaps one of the deals that's in the works now with the state of Virginia started to be struck here. That's right. So um, we announced in December that we were going to build the first commercial fusion power plant in Virginia. Uh, and that was a, a, a great partnership with the, the state, with the governor, um, and various other parties, uh, the utility. But actually at this summit uh, last year, me and the governor you know, carved some time out on the side to say, what would it be like to actually you know, put a fusion power plant in Virginia? And it's that big part of the story getting that deal done. How big is the power plant? So the one in Virginia will be 400 megawatts. So that's the size of like a, a large coal plant or a large natural gas plant. And in fact, it will uh, go where we were, uh, they were planning to put some natural gas and that'll be fusion. Um, or like a smaller nuclear reactor, big enough to power a data center. In fact, that plant, uh, the power for that plant has already been bought by Google to power data centers in Virginia. When does it come online? We haven't started to build it yet. We're just in the, the permitting phase now. Um, we're waiting for our prototype plant in Massachusetts to operate. That's still about two years out. Okay. After that, we'll start construction. But that puts the plant in Virginia, a commercial power plant with power on the grid in the early 2030s. So with fusion energy, one of the things I've heard is that um, the technology to basically support the like helium-3, for example, I've heard come up in, in the conversation around fusion energy um, and this idea of what it takes to keep the infrastructure where it needs to be to be A, safe, and B, generating power. What goes into that? Yeah, so with fusion, the actual fuels, uh, the easiest fuels to use are actually fuels that we have here already. So we don't need to go to the moon to get helium-3. People want to do that, and there, there's some maybe advantages, but that's probably later on. Okay. The fuels everyone has, so like a cup of coffee has enough of the fuel to run an entire lifetime of energy, and so everyone has access to that. But the hard part is, can you actually build the machines in the right way so that you create the conditions for the reaction to happen? That's where the science is. The machines themselves, though, they're like fabricated in factories, and we have a factory in Massachusetts that, that puts these machines together. They're high-precision steel you know, parts, a, a supply chain. And that looks like building a rocket or looks like building uh, a plane, which naturally fits in with some of the overlap in, in this particular conference. Okay. Um, in terms of the science itself, then what goes into getting that first power plant in Massachusetts up and running? Is that just because of permitting and construction and 
safety reviews and things like that, or is it the science itself that takes a while to get to this point of actually being able to generate energy? About four years ago, we had a big breakthrough in, in a piece of the science that okay. allowed us to, to drastically shrink what was needed to build one of these power plants. Okay. So literally like 50 times smaller. So that was the- That's huge. Huge deal, huge deal. And it was in 2021 and it was able, um, allowed us to raise a lot, a lot of capital, allowed us to really launch the next phase of the company, which is to go and build the prototype, we call it Spark. And so that was the moment where the science and the engineering became good enough that you could actually go and, and build a machine that you show up and push a button with a star in the bottle. That machine is now well into construction. It's about 70% complete. It's a multi-billion dollar project. It's, it's one of the biggest advanced energy projects in the United States. And uh, it's now the stage in, in Massachusetts where you know, we're putting all the parts together. The parts are there, we're bolting it together. We'll start to turn it on. Uh, here in, in 2026 and then in 27 start to make more power and this is clean energy this is clean so this is no emissions uh, there's not really anything that goes in and out of a fusion power plant which is which is crazy to think about like we're used to energy being you know very much about consumption you know you find uh, and dig up fossil fuels or you wait for the wind or the, the sun and, and of course the stars don't do that right the stars just they just are and they don't really have any inputs other than uh, what they started with, and then their output is just energy. Fusion's that same way. So effectively, when you build a fusion power plant, you're building something that is not any consumption of natural resource. You're building a technology that if you know how to build it, you can just build more of them. And that's like why it's so intriguing and thought of as the, the holy grail, because there's effectively no limit to how many of those you could build. And there's not any externalities about what happens when you build them. Does that, I mean, at a time where we're having so many conversations about the promise of nuclear and bringing that back in a bigger, more meaningful way through the end of this decade and into the next, does that then disrupt that business model? Um, not so much because the amount of energy that we need is so big, right? The world's energy consumption is, is almost unfathomably large and it has to grow, it has to double in the next 25 years. And so it's not so much a, you know, a question of like, which energy source is gonna win? The question is, can we get enough energy fast enough. Hmm. So there's space for everyone. Hmm. Um, safety, how to think about this when you say star in a bottle. Yeah, yeah when you think of a star in a bottle, I mean, most people think like, oh, it's like, you know, lava or, or something like 100 million degrees really hot. But actually the, the reaction itself at any given time has less than a gram, like a, a grain of rice, a fuel in it. And you can, you can actually stop the reaction by just blowing it out like a candle. Um, it's, it's a fragile reaction, and that's one of the challenges to even make it work. And so with these, these fusion machines, the safety implications are they should automatically shut off if there's any problem, uh, and then there's no long-lived nuclear waste, and there's nothing about them that's related to the uranium or plutonium that you worry about from a weapons standpoint. So they're decoupled from traditional nuclear power in that way, which, which makes them uh, a much easier technology to regulate, a much, a much safer technology uh, to field. Uh, but they are, it's a new technology, so you still have to explain it and, and bring people along on the journey. Mm. Um, you've raised billions of dollars to get to this point. I guess what's the trajectory from here? When do you get to a place where you're generating revenue and maybe considering an IPO if that's even in the cards? Well, you know, this is a uh, effort that is deep in the science, moving into the commercialization, and, and we're on that trajectory now with the first plant in Virginia starting to shape up in terms of who the customers are going to be, the exact site, the utility dominion. Um, and so we, we can start to see what that first commercial product will look like and how it will be delivered. That's super exciting. That's still a couple years away, um, but you can start to put together what the financial package would be to build that. You can start to think about what the the factory would be like to build that. We have that factory now in Massachusetts. So we can start to see what commercialization looks like. But we're still at the stage now where we gotta turn the one on in Massachusetts here in the next couple of years, and then actually put the shovels in the ground and build the one in Virginia. Okay, Bob Mumgard, it's great to speak with you, thank you.